Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. February 1941 in Auschwitz, Poland, Maximilian Kolb was put in the infamous death camp for helping Jews escape Nazi terrorism. Not long after he was there, an escape attempt took place by the Jews, and the camp rule was then enforced. Ten people would be rounded up randomly and herded into a cell where they would die of starvation and exposure as a lesson against future escape attempts. Names were called, a Polish Jew Frandiskek Kasabnicek was called. He cried out, wait, I have a wife and children. And Kolb stepped forward and said, I will take his place. Kolb was marched into the cell with nine others where he managed to live until August 14th. The Nazis then injected him with carbolic acid and his body was cremated in the camp ovens. This story was chronicled on a television special years ago Gasabnicek, by this time 82, was shown telling this story while tears streamed down his cheeks. A camera followed him around his little white house to a marble monument carefully tended with flowers. The inscription read, In memory of Maximilian Kolb, he died in my place. Nearly every year since on August 14th, Gasabnicek has made a journey to Auschwitz to just walk around the death camp in memory of Kolb. And every day since 1941, Gasabnicek has lived with the knowledge, as he put it, I live because someone died for me. And we who have trusted the gospel live with that knowledge as well. Someone took our place. Christ died in our place. And we live because he died for us. Our Savior took our sins upon himself and he suffered and died not for his sins, because he was sinless. He suffered and died for our sins. And having trusted Christ's all-sufficient payment for our sins on the cross, that he died for our sins and rose again the third day, we live and we have eternal life in Christ. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah speaks of the glorious truth of substitution and our Savior taking our place and dying for our sins. Isaiah 53, 1-3 reads, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53 is a very special chapter in God's Word. The Apostle Paul writes of the gospel that saves us from all of our sins in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And he says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. When he says according to the Scriptures, he's referring to passages such as Isaiah 53. We see the cross here, and unmistakably, chapter 53 speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every detail of the prophet's words corresponds to the person and work of the Lord Jesus. It's exciting for us as believers today to look at a prophecy like this, 700 years before the cross, and realize that God had the cross in mind all the while. It's important to always rightly divide God's Word. And as we rightly divide God's Word here, it's important to note that when looking at this passage, that the pronouns are, we, us, in their proper interpretation and in their context, in light of who Isaiah, was, this book was written to, is the nation of Israel. And we are not Israel. We are the church, the body of Christ. 
So when we think of ourselves, people living in this current dispensation of grace, the original interpretation did not apply to us. It applied to Israel under the law. And thus the all we that he talks about here and us all used in the passage does not present Christ bearing the sins of all mankind. It's literally all we in Israel and us all in Israel. So to be consistent with the cross and prophecy, we need to interpret this passage in that light. Yet the substitutionary work of Christ at the cross is just as true of us, the body of Christ, as it was for Israel and is consistent with the further revelation given about the cross to the Apostle Paul, as we also learn through Paul that Christ died for all. Who hath believed our report, verse 1 says, the prophecy points forward to the days of the Messiah's ministry on earth in Israel, and the question is, who, hath, who has believed on him? And the idea is, where are they all? There should be more. Haven't more believed is the idea? The prophet in the prophecy is deeply moved and incredulous to see how few believed on him because of the report and prophecy about him. They should have known. They should have believed. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He says, the arm of the Lord speaks of strength. It speaks of might. It speaks of power. And so the question is, how many have experienced the power of God, the saving power of the Lord? And in other words, the answer is not many. The arm of the Lord was not revealed to very many because not very many believed in him. And so this kind of verse reminds us of our day too, that our, we should be just as incredulous and our hearts should break as well at how many today reject the Savior, reject his love, and how many need to hear, how many need to believe the report from his word about him. Two reasons are given why all ought to have believed. First, the scripture, the report of the prophets who prophesied of him. Jesus Christ fulfilled all messianic prophecies. He showed that he truly was the long promised and prophesied Messiah. And more in Israel should have believed the report. The other reason is that the arm of the Lord was revealed in him so clearly. The arm, the power of God was seen and exhibited in Christ's life and ministry through his many miracles and through his cross and by his resurrection. All in Israel were left without excuse. The fulfilled scripture and Christ's words and works and death and resurrection all revealed who he was as their Messiah. Though unrecognized by the world, Christ was carefully observed by the Father from the beginning of his earthly life. And he grew up before the Father, verse 2 says, as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. As he sprung from the root of Jesse in the Davidic line. And Israel was not a paradise when Christ was born. Politically and spiritually, it was dry ground. And the Savior grew up as a tender plant before the Father in poverty in a humble carpenter's home in the hills of Galilee and Nazareth. And verse 2 remarks that in how he looked in his physical appearance, he had no form or stately form, nor comeliness or splendor. And when Israel saw him, there was no beauty or countenance that they should delight in him, it says in verse 2. In other words, there was nothing about his physical appearance that made him different from any other Jewish man. Mankind tends to put a lot of importance on physical appearance, but when God put on flesh and came to earth as a man, he chose to come in appearance as a humble, common, ordinary person. He bore the appearance of an everyday Jewish male. His true royal and divine and glorious identity was visible, but it was visible to the discerning eye of faith. Verse 3 points out that in his life and ministry, he was despised and rejected of men. He was despised because he did not represent the things that were and are important to mankind. Wealth, social prestige, political power, reputation, being served by others. 
And so Israel hid their faces from him and turned from him, and they esteemed him not, or they did not respect him, but rather they disdained him and looked on him with contempt. From this kind of response toward him in his ministry, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The Savior experienced sorrow. He truly knew what grief was. He suffered external abuse and rejection, and this caused him inward grief and sorrow over the lack of response from those he came to save in Israel. We have a Savior who is sympathetic toward us in our sorrows, grief, and rejection. He experienced all these same things in his life. He knows what grief is. He knows what sorrow feels like. He knows what it means to be rejected and despised and not respected. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. The Confession of Sins is a 36-page booklet written by Pastor Ken Lawson. Is 1 John 1.9 a part of God's will for the present dispensation of grace? This booklet is a re-examination of 1 John 1.9, providing a proper view of it, both within its dispensational context in the New Testament and also within the context of the epistle of 1 John itself. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Isaiah 53, 4-6 reads, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Even though the verbs are past tense, they predict happenings way future to Isaiah's time. This occurs in prophecy often because when God says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. So it can be put past tense as if it already happened. Verse 4 is a prophecy of the cross. Isaiah was prophesying that the Messiah would bear the consequences of the sins of Israel, namely their griefs and their sorrows of life. But verse 4 also prophesies that when those in Israel saw Christ on the cross and as they watched him die, they thought he was being punished by God for his own sins. They understood his severe suffering and agonizing death to mean he was stricken struck down and afflicted by God for something wrong that he had done. When in truth, verse 5 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The emphasis in verses 4 uh, through 6 is on the plural pronouns, our griefs, our sorrows, our iniquities, our transgressions. We have gone astray. We have turned to our own way. In other words, he did not die because of anything he had done, but because of what others had done. He died as a substitute for sinners, and he took our place. Again, Isaiah is writing to the nation of Israel, and the hours and we's are referring to the nation Israel. But we know through Paul's gospel that Christ died for all. He gave himself a ransom for all. He died for us. He died for our sins and iniquities and for our transgressions as well. The word wounded here in verse 5 literally means pierced through. Christ's hands and feet were pierced through by nails. His side was pierced through by a spear. 
The reason he was pierced through and crucified was for our transgressions, it says, as the just payment for the transgressions of sinners. Christ was bruised, which literally means crushed, under the weight of a heavy burden. The heavy burden was sin. And verse 6 says, at the end of verse 6, that the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And on the cross, Christ was crushed under the weight of sin and the judgment and wrath and fury of God that fell on him in paying the sin debt for Israel and for the world. In selfless love, he received chastisement or punishment for the, the transgressions and iniquities of sinners to procure their peace so Israel might have peace with God. And we too learn that having been justified by faith and trusting what Christ did for us at the cross and dying for our sins, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He was given many stripes, it says in verse 5, in his scourging. In the scourging he received with that whip that had stone, glass, metal embedded in its lashes that went across his back over and over again and again and again. It ripped his back raw, and yet those stripes brought spiritual healing to those who believed in him in Israel. The healing here in verse uh, 5 refers to the forgiveness of sins, not to the healing of the body. As Peter wrote to Israel in his epistles, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Notice the terms of suffering Christ face that are packed together in these verses in this chapter. Griefs, sorrows, stricken, smitten, afflicted, wounded, bruised, chastised, stripes, oppressed, slaughter, cut off, poured out. Sin is serious. Isaiah calls it transgression, which means rebellion against God, daring to cross the line that God has made. He calls it iniquity, which refers to the evil and crookedness of our sinful deeds. The severity of punishment on the Savior measures how seriously God takes our rebellion and sinfulness. Because we typically want to make light of what we call our shortcomings. We try to explain away our mistakes or we call them our weaknesses or our faults. But sin is not a light thing to God. Sin is the stuff of death and separation and judgment and condemnation. And unless our sins are paid for, sin will see us condemned forever to the lake of fire, where those there will suffer for their sins forever and ever and ever and torment and torture forever. The cross is much, much more than just an example of sympathy and compassion. It is the actual bearing by Christ of the full punishment and judgment of sin. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, verse 6 says. Again, this is all we in Israel. Jeremiah 56 uh, says, My people hath been lost sheep. While this speaks specifically to Israel, it is true that we too, we've gone astray, and that all without exception are sinners. Romans teaches that we are all born with a sin nature and we all sin in word, thought, and deed. And we do go astray and we do go our own way and we walk in self-will and we all fall short of the glory and perfection and righteousness and goodness of God. But Christ went God's way and he walked in God's will perfectly. And in accord with the Father's will, he went to the cross to save Israel and to save the world from their sins. And so he willingly was pierced through as a result of mankind's rebellion. He voluntarily was crushed on account of our sins. He willingly took those stripes for you. And that's incredible love 
amazing grace and unbelievable mercy. Isaiah 53, verses 7 through 12 read, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In willingly giving himself as a sacrifice for sin, he opened not his mouth. In verse 7. Christ was silent before those who accused him, as well as those who afflicted him. He did not speak when the soldiers mocked him and beat him. He was silent before Caiaphas, the chief priests and elders, Pilate, Herod, Antipas. And it even amazed them, it astounded them that he would not speak on his behalf. In Acts 8, that's what impressed the Ethiopian eunuch as he read this passage and Isaiah, and he asked Philip who this was talking about. Christ was the sacrificial lamb of God, and in being led to the slaughter, he made no resistance. He uttered no complaint, no protest, no defense. He allowed himself to be led to death for us. In his limitless power as God, no human hand could have come close to arresting and taking Christ had he not allowed it. His death was completely voluntary. He laid down his life. He was not a helpless victim. And then verse 8 says that he was cut off out of the land of the living. And cut off speaks of a violent, vicious death, which his crucifixion truly was. But the prophet says again that the reason for the Savior's suffering and death was for the transgressions of others. And the prophet adds, And who shall declare his generation? And again, he's astounded like he was back in verse 1. And the idea is, who can set forth the wickedness of that generation? That is, of his contemporaries that brought this about. Isaiah 53 describes the life and ministry of Christ in verses 1 through 3. His death in verses 4 through 8. His burial in verse 9. And his resurrection and exaltation in verses 10 through 12. Christ died on the cross, and then he was buried. And Isaiah 53, 9 says that he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Making his grave with the rich in his death was fulfilled in Christ's burial. Matthew 27, 57 through 60 says, A rich man of Arimathea named Joseph went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus and laid it in his own new tomb. Verse 9 also reminds us of the absolute perfection and sinlessness of this one who died. He had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He hadn't died for any sins he had done. He had died for the sins of others. And though he did not deserve to die, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, it says there, our God the Father saw fit, and it was His will to bruise. And again, that word means to crush Him under the weight of a heavy burden as the Lamb of God, as the payment for sin at the cross. He was God's perfect sacrifice for sin, and He willingly gave Him for us to die 
to pay for our sins. And Christ accomplished God's perfect plan of redemption to secure the salvation of sinners, and the Father was well pleased with that. And as we know, Christ, God's Son, did not remain dead. In those words, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. That's a prophecy that the Messiah would be resurrected. Demonstrating his complete victory over sin and death, he rose again. And in his resurrection, he triumphed over every enemy. And to the Father, verse 11 teaches that he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Christ's offering for sin and the travail of his soul at the cross satisfied God the Father. If God the Father was satisfied with Christ's finished work, then that teaches us something. It teaches us where we need to look and who we need to trust to be saved from our sins and to have the sure hope of heaven. We need to look to Christ. We need to look to the cross. We need to look to his resurrection. The perfect work of Christ at the cross completely satisfied the Father and satisfied his justice and met his just demands against sin. God cannot ignore sin. He does not compromise with it because that would be contrary to his own nature and law. But through the cross and by Christ's substitutionary payment for sin, God's justice was fully satisfied and God now graciously redeems and freely justifies all who believe in what Christ did for us at the cross in dying for our sins and rising again. It's been rightly said that an empty cross plus an empty tomb equals a full salvation. We hope that you have made the personal decision to trust in God's full salvation found through His Son and by His death and resurrection. Just believing that Christ died for your sins personally and rose again you are saved, and you have a home in heaven. Make that decision right now if you've never done so. If you'd ever like to talk to someone about salvation, please feel free to call us here at Brian Bible Society at 262-255-4750. Thank you for watching this episode of Transformed by Grace. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.